In this video, I'm going to show you how you can do budget impact analysis in Excel. This analysis can be used to estimate the change in expenditure to a budget holder resulting from a decision to reimburse a new healthcare intervention or policy. I've built several budget impact models myself that have been used with various payers around the world, which is why I can tell you with confidence that they're not at all complicated to put together. With very little effort, you can create a budget impact model like the one on screen, allowing you to derive costs, epidemiology, and market shares to build a model engine which provides interesting budget impact results. Let's begin with our scenario and the objective of this model. For today, I'm going to focus on a second line therapy for type 2 diabetes, whereby I'm assuming that there are two drugs available for this line of treatment. Treatment A is the new option for patients with second line type 2 diabetes, and it has just been reimbursed. Treatment B is the long established standard of care, which will be displaced by treatment A over time. Our aim is to calculate the budget impact of introducing our new drug A to the treatment mix, which we're going to achieve by comparing a world with treatment A against a world without treatment A. For the sake of this video, we're putting ourselves in the shoes of a budget manager for NHS England, who's been tasked with quantifying the five-year budget impact of introducing treatment A from a national perspective. We can start off by collecting the relevant cost inputs for our model. To help us do this, it's very useful to think about the different types of costs we're interested in for our budget impact model. These can be split into two, including treatment-related and condition-related costs. Treatment-related costs are costs such as drug acquisition costs, costs for administration, monitoring costs, or costs for the treatment of adverse events. Condition-related costs, on the other hand, are costs which are associated with managing the symptoms and or consequences of the condition. I'm going to start with the drug acquisition costs, which for England, you can source from websites like the BNF, which I'm going to link down in the video description. As it is the new therapy, treatment A comes at a price premium with a yearly cost of 500 pounds. Treatment B is less expensive with a cost of just 300 pounds per year. Note that for all of our costs, we want to calculate an annual cost per patient, as this is going to make it much easier for us later on to extrapolate costs over our five year time horizon. Next up for treatment A, there is an additional administration cost that we want to capture. Since treatment A is an injection which has to be administered quarterly by a nurse, the costs for the nurse's time need to be reflected in our model. Let's assume that the cost for the nurse to administer the injection is 50 pounds, and it has to be done four times a year since it's a quarterly injection, which gives us a cost of 200 pounds per patient per year for the administration of treatment A. Treatment B, on the other hand, is a tablet that patients can take themselves, so there is no administration costs associated with treatment B. Additionally, patients need to get monitored while they receive active therapy. For diabetes, such monitoring costs could include blood pressure monitoring or laboratory tests like blood glucose levels or glycated hemoglobin tests. For these factors, I'm going to assume a monitoring cost of 25 pounds, and I'm further assuming that treatment A requires more frequent monitoring than B, as it is the new therapy option. This gives us a yearly per patient monitoring cost of 150 pounds for treatment A and B respectively. Moving on to the treatment related adverse event costs, we know that 5% of patients on treatment A experience an injection site reaction. If you're serious about getting an accurate estimate for these types of costs, you could look at NHS England reference costs or RWE datasets like CPRD or HES. But to be honest, I can't really be bothered to look into this right now, so I'm just going to assume a cost of 100 pounds. While treatment B doesn't have any injection site reactions, it has been associated with severe rare side effects that occur in 2% of all patients. Since these side effects are difficult to treat, they are also very costly at a price of £3,000. As not every patient experiences these side effects though, we apply our percentages to these costs to derive an annual per patient adverse event cost. With our treatment related costs completed, we can now focus on the condition specific costs. First in this category, we've got hospitalizations due to, let's say, cardiovascular events. 
it is important to remember that these hospitalizations need to be part of the broader diabetes disease burden as they otherwise might fall under treatment related costs. If for example, the hospitalization was due to an adverse event caused by the drug itself, we need to include it under the adverse event costs in our model. That's not the case here though. So I'm assuming a cost of 7,500 pounds for the hospital to cover the cardiovascular event with a likelihood of this event of 1% for treatment B. Furthermore, we know that patients on treatment A don't experience this event. Again, knowing the fraction of patients on B who get hospitalized for the cardiovascular event, we can calculate the cost per year per patient, which is 75 pounds for B and zero for A because there is no probability for patients on A to actually experience this adverse event. Lastly, we're counting the costs for outpatient visits. In our diabetes example, this could be a visit to the endocrinologist once a year to get general diabetes lifestyle counseling or tailored advice from a dietitian. I'm assuming that this condition related cost is the same for both treatment A and B, which we'll factor in with a cost of 175 pounds per patient per year. For our epi inputs, we want to know two things really. First, we want to know the disease prevalence. This gives us an idea how many patients have the disease right now. Second, we need to understand the disease incidence. This tells us how many new cases there are over a defined time period. Let's start with the prevalence. I'm going to use a top-down approach to calculate our epidemiological cascade. Since we are tasked with building the budget impact model for England, we can start by sourcing the total population figure for England, which we know is about 57.5 million, according to the latest ONS data. Next, we want to know how many people in England have diabetes. Now, I haven't really done the actual research on this, but I'm just going to assume 7% for our example here. As our treatment only covers type 2 diabetes patients, we further need to make assumptions about the proportion of patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. During our research, we find out that type 2 is significantly more common than type 1 diabetes, and we find a study that quantifies type 2 diabetes prevalence with 90%. Out of those 90%, not all receive drug therapy. Especially during early stages of the disease, some patients might manage their blood sugar levels through lifestyle interventions only, thereby improving their insulin sensitivity without having to use actual medication. To account for this, we're going to assume that 70% of type 2 patients are on drug therapy. Lastly, we want to reflect that our two treatments are indicated for second line treatment only. So patients must have failed their first line treatment before they can receive either treatment A or treatment B. I'm just simply going to assume that 40% of patients are on second line therapy, which finally gives us our prevalent patient population for our model. Since we've modeled a top-down epi cascade, you could change population inputs, for example, by switching England to the US total population figures, and your epi numbers would update accordingly. However, you would be making the very strong assumption here that all other inputs for prevalence, tab one and two distribution, medication use, and second-line therapy are comparable across the US and England, which might not be true. Given how important the population estimates are for the total budget impact, you should always pay very close attention to the inputs that you select, making sure that they reflect the real world conditions as closely as possible. With our prevalence done, we can move on to the incidence. After all, our diabetes population will not remain stagnant over time, and instead we need to account for the new cases that get diagnosed every year. Therefore, we're assuming an incidence of 150,000. Using the assumptions we've made for incidence and prevalence, we can then calculate our eligible patient population over a five-year time horizon. I like to start with a baseline year zero, which I'm going to populate with the prevalence estimate we've calculated before. As you can see from this figure, the eligible patient population in our year one consists of our prevalent population cohort, plus our incidence cohort. Then in year two, three, four, and five, 
new incident cohorts enter the model each year. So in our case, 150,000 patients annually. What we haven't accounted for in our model is patients exiting our budget impact model, either through death or end of treatment, as indicated via these errors that you can see in the figure. I'm not going to bother with this for our simple example here, but it's something to keep in mind when you build your next budget impact model. Now that we know our eligible patient population for the next five years, we need to make some assumptions on the market shares of treatment A and treatment B. I'm going to create two tables for this. One which reflects the market shares in a world without the new intervention, and a second one for a world with the new intervention of treatment A. For our world without the new treatment intervention, our market share table is pretty simple. Since treatment A doesn't exist yet, all patients would receive treatment B. That's why the market share for B is 100% in every year. For the world with treatment A, it becomes slightly trickier. How quickly will treatment A capture the market share for treatment B? That's really the question we need to ask ourselves. In the real world, the speed of uptake will depend on factors such as clinical differentiation, support in the medical guidelines and the medical community, as well as the marketing and communication strategy, among other variables. I can tell you from personal experience that people from the pharma industry like to have lengthy discussions around these assumptions, trying to be very scientific with what they put into the model. But what I found, though, is that the market dynamics are pretty unpredictable, which means that these numbers are oftentimes nothing more than a best guess. For our example, let's assume that A is slowly gaining market shares from B, starting with 10% in year one and ending with 80% in year five. At this stage, we've got everything we need to build our model engine. And I know that the term model engine may sound intimidating to some people, but Trust me, all we're going to do is some simple multiplication, so it's really not rocket science at all. For starters, I'm going to transpose both our patient numbers and our market shares to make it easier for us to work with in our model. You can achieve this by using the transpose function in Excel, which converts rows to columns and vice versa. Once that's done, we can create the engine for our world without A. We do this by listing our six cost types we've estimated before, and calculate the costs for both A and B over our five-year time horizon. In the world without A, logically, all costs are zero, as treatment A doesn't exist yet. For treatment B, we can use the transposed patient numbers for each year and multiply these with the annual cost per patient using a fixed reference for the cost. We don't need to make any further adjustments here, as all patients receive treatment B, and the costs are already expressed per patient per year, so it works smoothly with our model structure. As a next step, we need to mirror the table we've created for the world without to create our table for the world with treatment A. The calculations are the same as for the table we've created before, only that this time we also need to factor in the market shares for A and B. For example, our monitoring costs for treatment A in year one depends on the eligible population in year one, multiplied by treatment A monitoring costs and adjusted for the market share of A, so 10% for year one. When you're finished creating this table for the world with A, you can create the last engine table in which we're comparing the results for the world without against the results for the world with treatment A. We can start doing this by pulling in the total costs in each year for the two scenarios. In the world without A, this is equal to the total cost for B, as all costs for A are zero. In the world with A, it's the sum of all costs for A plus all costs for B. With these two numbers for each year, we can calculate the budget impact for A by subtracting the world without total costs from the world with A total cost. Alternatively, we could express this on a per patient level rather than for the total population, for which we are dividing by the number of eligible patients in each year. Here you can see that our budget impact in our baseline year is zero, which makes sense as all costs are the same. We don't really need our year zero results for reporting results later, but I'm keeping it here for consistency. At this stage, you've already got budget impact results that you could report, 
But to be able to extract more detailed results from our engine, we first need to create another table for our six cost categories. To calculate our detailed comparison results by cost category, we add up the costs for A and B in each cost category using the future practice table and subtract the cost of A plus B using the current practice table. You can see this illustrated here where I use the trace precedence feature which you can find under the formulas tab in Excel. Additionally, we can duplicate this table to generate per patient results and you can generate per patient results by using a simple array formula in which you divide your total results by the number of eligible patients in each year. If we sum up these detailed results over five years, we get the cumulative five-year budget impact results per patient by cost category, which can also be reported and very useful to illustrate where the costs are actually coming from. At this stage, all that's left to say is congratulations, you've successfully built your engine for your budget impact model. And all that's left to do now is to really visualize your results in a pleasant and informative way. While you could present your results in a simple table format, I like to add some charts in Excel to catch the eye of the model user. I'll speed up this footage on screen as all you see me do here at this stage really is just formatting, but some good chart types to consider include clustered column charts to present budget impact results per year, clustered bar charts for the detailed cost by cost type, stacked area charts for the market shares and simple line charts for the prediction of the population size over time. Having done all of this, what can we learn from our results? Starting with our budget impact results over time, we see that our budget impact is positive in each year, growing steadily until year five. This means that the adoption of our new technology A will increase the overall healthcare expenditure. Of course, these results tell the same story whether we look at the total population results or at the per patient results. Moving on to the five year per patient results by cost type, we can see that treatment A actually helps us save money in certain areas. Both in terms of the hospitalization costs and adverse event costs, treatment A has a negative budget impact due to its lower hospitalization rate and less severe side effect profile. Even though the overall budget impact is of course still positive in our example, looking at the results by cost category gives a more granular picture, which helps us understand how different cost types affect our overall budget. Lastly, you could also visualize the market uptake inputs and eligible patient population numbers like you see here to give people who are using the model a better idea of the underlying assumptions used in the budget impact model. While a model very similar to the one I've shared with you today could in fact be used for discussions with national payers, here's a list of things to consider. First, make sure to validate the inputs you're using. BIMs can react very sensitive to both costs and API inputs as they're the main components which are driving the results. All API inputs should be sourced from papers that were identified through a proper systematic literature review. If you don't know how you can do a systematic literature review, you can check out my video on the topic, which will pop up on screen right now. Second, you should check out if there are any budget impact templates that are preferred or even mandatory for your purpose. NICE, for example, uses this standardized template and other organizations have similar templates. Third, you should follow best practice guidelines when building a model that's going to be shared with payers, like the ones issued by ISPO. I've linked several important documents in the video descriptions, so you can have a look for yourself and see what the best practices are. Lastly, try to make the model as simple and interactive as possible. While the model we've built today actually uses a very simple structure, it could be improved and made more user-friendly with customizable inputs, multiple tabs, and some extra time spent on formatting. If budget impact analysis is right up your alley, you'll also want to check out my video in which I've built a Markov cohort simulation model to compare two cancer drugs against one another. You can see that video on screen right now, so go check that one out next.